Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 590th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Do you know that there are many ways to water your garden? You want to explore what they are? I've got a free guide just for Urban Farm Podcast listeners that explores my favorite methods. We start with my epic full-length class called Wickedly Smart Water Harvesting, where I share many of the ways you can find water in your yard. This class ends with a challenge to see how many water sources you can find on your property. Next, we'll dive into my favorite way to water my gardens. This method was introduced to me about a decade ago by my good friend and mentor, Scott Murray. It is water efficient, self-cleaning, and draws from what large farms have used for decades. We boil it down to the backyard gardener level just for you. Think you can guess what it is? The guide also comes with a full description and list of supplies you'll need to install your own fully functional watering system. Learn and harvest your free Water Your Garden guide at urbanfarmwater.com. Today on our podcast, we have someone who is raising public awareness about gene editing. We're talking with Jeffrey Smith about genetically modified microbes. Jeffrey is a best-selling author, award-winning filmmaker, and celebrated public speaker. He has influenced the behavior and health of millions of people worldwide through his books like Seeds of Deception and Genetic Roulette and his podcast, Live Healthy, Be Well. Jeffrey is the founding executive director of the Institute for Responsible Technology, which has started a global education campaign called Protect Nature Now. With his first documentary titled Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle. That's a fun title. Welcome to the show today, Jeffrey. Are you ready to rock? Absolutely, Greg. Awesome. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took? To get where you you're over, at the today. Long, over the last six decades. Yeah, over the last six <laughs> decades, exactly. That's a long story. I'll tell you what, let's just wrap up a 25 year history and a pivot point to a new future. All right. So, 25 years ago, I went to a lecture on genetic engineering and went, oh my God, this is serious. Mm -hmm. And hardly anyone knows about it. They were about to release genetically engineered soy and corn in the state that I was living in, in Iowa. And Almost no one in the United States knew about it, but the person giving the lecture was a genetic engineer, and he said the process itself creates unpredicted side effects. Wow. There's no way that Monsanto could actually predict what it's doing to the food supply or, even worse, what it's doing to the gene pool, which could never be cleaned up because once you release a GMO, it becomes part of the genetic, the corrupted gene sequence of the genome, of the gene pool. And the only thing that lasts longer than a self-propagating genetic pollution is extinction. So I decided, wow. okay, I better, I better get involved here and <laughs> give a little bit of time. And that was 25 years ago. Wow. So you mentioned in, the, in my introduction that I'm focused on gene-edited microbes. And most people have no idea when they think of me that that's my focus right now. Because mm -hmm. I was better known and am better known for pioneering the behavior change messaging that alerted the world about the health dangers of GMOs. When I started looking at what was going on with GMOs, I realized, you know, all of the other nonprofits and NGOs and, and speakers were focusing on the environmental impact or the concentration of ownership by a few corporations or the, the inability, the problems with patenting life. Mm -hmm. But the entire coverage of the health dangers of GMOs was usually three sentences and occasionally four, and they were basically leaving that to be argued in the halls of science. And to me, that was a grave mistake because the health dangers was in fact the way to reach the consumers and that when you reach enough consumers and a critical mass, you can end up convincing them to avoid the GMOs, which puts more money in the hands of the companies that put non-GMO on their products, which drives everyone else to get rid of GMOs to put non-GMO on their products. So that was our plan. And it's been a success. So we had those two books. We had uh, four documentaries, included Secret Ingredients, the most mm -hmm. recent long form documentary, traveled to 45 countries, spoke, um, helped build a movement around the health dangers. And now at last survey, global survey with tons of people, 
we discovered that 48% of the world's population believes that GMOs foods are unsafe. Wow. 51, 51% of the United States. So we consider that a huge victory. And that's now creating the outcome that we plan, which is the, the divestment of GMOs from food companies so that they maintain market share. But along comes a new version of GMOs, gene editing. Now, in the last 25 years, there's been less than a dozen commercialized food crops. Gene editing is so cheap and easy that in the next 25 years, if we don't stop it, there could be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of GMOs released, which could replace nature permanently. So all future generations would not, as we did, inherit the products of the billions of years of evolution, but instead they would inherit the products of laboratory technologies, which number one most common result of which is surprise side effects. So gene editing is so cheap, you can do a, get a do-it-yourself kit on Amazon for $169. Wow. For, for companies like Bayer, they can create massive arrays of robots being driven by artificial intelligence to create massive numbers of GMOs. And we're talking about the, the situation where we have arrived at an inevitable time in human history where mankind can redirect the streams of evolution for all time, and yet we don't have the understanding of what that could mean. So we have pivoted. Instead of focusing primarily, and ex not exclusively, but primarily on the health dangers of GMOs for consumer choice, mm -hmm. we are now starting a new global movement to lock down the release of gene-edited organisms, but specifically and most importantly, at this time, microorganisms, including viruses, microbes and viruses, so, that, so basically protect the global microbiome. And as we'll see as in our, in our discussion, we may have a more serious moral alarm that goes off when we think about the, the Chinese scientists that gene edited human children that were born. That was but just last think, year, right? Yeah, it was a year ago, a year before that. Yeah. But the actual dangers to human health and the environment are far greater by genetically engineering the little guys. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic gives a perfect example of what could happen with a genetically engineered pandemic, potentially pandemic pathogen. I mean, there's one that was, for example, H5N1 virus is up to 24 times more deadly than the COVID-19 virus, but it hardly ever gets onto humans. You have to be around birds a lot. Right. So what did, what did engineers do? They created an airborne version. And I mean, that's just like, are you serious? No, no, no. It's in a highly secured lab. But did you realize that <laughs> there's been over a thousand releases from secure labs? So why are wow. we? That's just one example of why the microbiome is so important to not mess around with. So the really the big problem, and I've seen this for years myself, is not the genetic, genetically modified work itself, although there's probably issues with that. It's how it gets out. And when we're talking when we're talking about corn, Bill McDormand, a longtime friend of mine and seed guy here in the country, he doesn't believe that that there is organic corn any longer. Well, I can tell you, having worked at a GMO detection laboratory twenty years ago, uh -huh. and being aware of certain strains that are hard to cross pollinate that borrow genetics from popcorn, which doesn't easily cross pollinate, you can get clean corn, mm, uh -huh. but but most of it has a small presence of genetic contamination from GMO corn, even at great distances. I mean, pollen travels, for some reason, we have no idea. I mean, there was a, I just did a report on cotton in wild cotton plants, mm -hmm. varieties in Mexico that were contaminated by genetically engineered cotton that was uh, about 2000 kilometers away, 1200 miles. Wow. So, so we don't have, we don't have it locked down. Yeah. And, which, and the thing is with, with microbes, it doesn't, I mean, microbes travel around the world. We saw what happened with the COVID-19 exactly. virus. Exactly. Around the world quickly, and it keeps moving, keeps moving. Bacteria can do the same thing. There was a secret study reported by whistleblowers at the EPA to uh, Elaine Ingham, a former professor of Oregon State University. She was told, and she told me, and it's in the film, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, which you can see at protectnaturenow.com when it becomes released. You can see the trailer now, that... The EPA released genetically engineered bacteria in a test site in Louisiana to see how far it would spread. Oh. 
well, and one, you know, 11 miles later, 11 miles in one generation, another 11 miles in another year. And eventually they, they just stopped funding the experiment. Well, I guess it gets around. But some individuals within the EPA decided to continue gathering samples and testing. And it got to the point where they found it everywhere on the planet. So the wow. bacteria, just like we know that COVID-19 virus traveled yep. all over the world. Now we know that bacteria, genetically engineered, can travel all over the world. So now bacteria and the microbiome is in every cubic inch of the earth. It's in the atmosphere. They it's all in have their gut. Own, in our gut. And what, do, what does the microbiome do? It exchanges genetic information. And what does it do? It upholds health. More than 80% of the human chronic diseases are driven by ecosystem dysfunction in our human gut microbiome and overall microbiome. The microbiome is the foundation for health for ecosystems. You can have ecosystem collapse by messing with the microbiome. And what we're doing when we introduce genetically engineered microbes is introducing unknown elements that have not been part of the millions of years of evolution, co-evolution, right. and we could end up causing disease, death, and ecosystem collapse by the things that we do now that are well-intentioned. And we have some specific near-miss examples in the film. Wow. So just real quickly, I want to go back to the seeds and then we'll come back here. So on a scale, the magnitude at which pollen from plants travel uh, is one level. This magnitude of biological microbiome stuff is exponentially greater, is oh, it not? Incredible. Not only exponentially greater in terms of travel, uh -huh. but it's also in terms of influence because bacteria swap genetic elements. So, you know, it'll pull like, like they're trading cards. It's like, okay, this will help me adapt to this ecosystem. Oh, you have that? That'll help me survive. Oh, I can create a, a new version of myself over here and end up in this ecosystem. So that's part of the way the microbiome works is the swapping. Second, they go through generations very, very quickly. Third, genetic engineering, whether in corn or in microbes, the genetic constructs can change over time. And can mutate over time. So what you've done a safety assessment on on Tuesday may be different <laughs> by Thursday, especially in the micro world. Yeah. So you end up with mutations, adaptions, and and changes that you can never predict. And even the process of genetic engineering can cause hundreds of thousands of mutations up the DNA, which they don't account for, don't even evaluate in most cases. So when you change the microbiome, you're now affecting wherever that would get to and interact with new ecosystems. And some of those ecosystems are within our pets, are within fish, are within plants, are within humans, are in the atmosphere, are on, on the skin. Food, on our skin, we have a microbiome on our skin, in our mouth, in our nose. And so if you introduce a genetically engineered bacterium for soil remediation, that can fix nitrogen or do something and maybe you produce some antibacterial elements so that it becomes dominant in the soil because oh you gosh. want to kill off the other stuff. And maybe you produce something that allows it to survive longer because you want to inoculate the soil. Now that gets into the human gut microbiome and all of a sudden you have something that is killing off other elements, destroying the, the biodiversity, causing survival of itself. Maybe it swaps that gene with the pathogens causing over survival of the pathogen. You have no idea what its impact is on autism, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, overweight, fatigue, schizophrenia, all of these things are linked to the microbiome. And so we're releasing it in a field saying, oh, it's designed for a cornfield. And it ends up in the atmosphere, in our gut, in China, everywhere in the world with 10,000 different ecosystems. And that's just a, I mean, it's many more than that because it's also internal ecosystems, yeah. wreaking potential havoc and creating potential devastation. And we can go through in a couple of examples of what that might look like. For Please. So, All right. So the reason why Elaine Ingham was told by the whistleblower at the EPA is because she had spoken at the UN and whatnot about a particular experiment that she was aware of because her graduate student that she was, who she was advising did an experiment on genetically engineered bacteria. Mm -hmm. And the bacteria was designed by other scientists to help farmers. Well-intentioned. I have to make this clear. The scientists are not the enemy. They're well-intentioned. It's the inability to understand the consequences of these releases, 
which is so dangerous play. It's yeah. like handing, handing an atomic bomb to a child and said, oh, don't press that button. So these scientists took Klebsiella planticola, which is on the root structures of all the plants in the world, and it helps break down matter. And they said, okay, let's break down the plant matter into alcohol. Let's put a new gene in so that it turns plant matter into alcohol. Then instead of burning the crop residues on fields, farmers can rake it up, put it in big barrels, add the bacteria, open the spigot two weeks later, and run their tractors with the alcohol produced on their field. Wow. And, you, and it sounds like a great idea, right? They can sell the they could sell the alcohol off the farm. It's an extra income. They even have built-in uh, fertilizer because there's nutrient-rich sludge at the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm. So this was going to be released to see how far it spread. And then once they passed that, then it was going to be sent to farmers around the world. It had already passed all the tests required by the EPA. But the graduate student needed to get something, some research done for his PhD. So he asked and got permission from the scientists to use their bacteria for his own thing. And it, it was not required. It was not a safety assessment. It uh -huh. was just some observation he wanted to do. So he took the nutrient-rich sludge and mixed it with soil and planted wheat seeds and then took uh, controls and planted wheat seeds there. And one day on a Saturday morning, he shows up at his lab and thinks, oh my God, I must have done something wrong. Because all of the wheat seeds that were starting to grow in the trays that had mixed the nutrient-rich sludge with oh my gosh, were dead. They had actually turned to slime. It was just slime on the top of the of the soil. Wow. So he thought he did something wrong, but actually the, in the nutrient rich sludge was the still functioning Klebsiella planticula bacteria turning plant matter into alcohol. So he realized that his tray of soil was infertile. It could not support terrestrial plants because it would turn the roots and then the crops into sludge. alcohol. Yeah. Right? The sludge. Now, this was two weeks before the scientists were going to release this outdoors to see how far it could travel. Now, oh, we wow. know how far bacteria can travel, right? Yeah. We've been through that. So I ask Elaine Ingram, and you got to watch this in the film, what is the natural consequence or what would be the impact of releasing this into the environment? What could happen? And she said, well, Holy. the natural <laughs> let, let me let me, let me, let me, let me make it clear. It could end terrestrial Life, plant. yeah, terrestrial plant life. Holy shirt, Batman! Yeah, and she see she was like very clear to me. Oh no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't have that same effect in agriculture. We could still grow kelp, and I'm like, oh good, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, like we can live off of kelp. So when you said that, I kind of knew what was coming, but when you said that, I got chills all the way down my body. Oh, yeah. It's like that. That is an extinction level event that we were two oh, weeks yeah. away from. It is a cataclysm. And the thing is, it was two weeks away. And I mean, you got to watch this film, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, because that's just one of the examples. The other one is the H5N1, which we talked about. Another mm. one is there's bacteria in the atmosphere that makes rain, snow, sleet. It helps pull together the moisture. It causes, causes freezing at, at higher temperatures that would normally happen. Yep. And you know, some well-intentioned scientists wanted to protect strawberries and potatoes from early frost. Yep. And if they had released their, in this case, the name was Pseudomonas syringae, if they released that into the environment, and if, big if, it had <clears throat> out-survived and displaced its natural counterpart, the Pseudomonas syringae in the atmosphere above California, where I live, actually condenses the moist air causing rainfall in California, which we need. Yep. Imagine if that impotent GMO variety had displaced the natural one, then all of that moisture would maybe be going somewhere else until and, and be condensing elsewhere. Unless, of course, that place also has Pseudomonas syringae that's impotent. So we could talk about changing weather patterns. We could talk about a devastating uh, H5N1 or any matter of pathogen. We could talk about ending terrestrial plant life. We could talk about incorporating disease-creating microbes in our gut bacteria. Or we can even talk more abstractly about minor adjustments 
in human gut bacteria. I was talking to Kieran Krishnan, one of the world's experts at the microbiome, the human microbiome. He talks about how certain organisms in our gut cause us to crave sweets. Certain organisms in our gut cause yep. us cause us to have to be social, mm -hmm. to reach, to connect with other people, so we can swap microbiome materials and get the oxytocin, which helps promote uh, the organism's development. The, we know that the gut bacteria can determine whether we're fat or skinny, whether we're sm whether we're happy or sad. Dietrich Klinghart described how the microbiome in the brain creates intelligence. And if you and Kieran went even further to say that we only have 22,000 genes in our genome, less than an earthworm, but we have 3.5 million genetic elements from the microbes in us, from the microbiome, and that's what we use. Most of our metabolic functions are not done through our genetic structure. They're delegated to the microbiome. So he was talking about we have, what, you know, most disease in, the, in, the, in humans comes from leaky gut, according to yep. a Harvard researcher, and the, the, the degradation of the gut lining. We have no genes in our body to, to, ID, to identify that and to organize the healing of it. It's all the microbiome. Well, there's microbiomes that there's bacteria that go in there that do quorum sensing that figure out what the current population is, what it needs. It can send L, it can send signals to the body saying you need to bring in a new cell because there's one that's damaged along the gut lining. You need to bring in new elements to cause gaps that, to close so that we can you know, correct the leaky gut. He said if he had 10,000 scientists and all the money he needed, he could not design elements to do what the existing microbes in our body are already pre-wired to do in their millions of years of evolution. Now we take genetically engineered microbes designed for something by a narrow, narrow viewing, blinder wearing scientist focused on, on protecting strawberries or giving an advantage to farmers or changing the probiotics of the soil. We give them the tools that they can, for $2,000, you can set up a very flexible CRISPR gene editing kit and start pumping out different organisms. And maybe you flush them down the toilet if you don't like them and oh you, just, you just released it for all time. Yeah. And you create changes in the microbiome that will go on forever and that will change the nature of ecosystems that you hadn't even envisioned. And it may be that it's not a cataclysmic event. It may be that it just turns up the, uh, the susceptibility to cancer or mm -hmm. turns down the happiness or increases the ability for obesity. And we may never know that it was a release in Louisiana, possibly the one that was released by the EPA for their tests, that is causing changes in human behavior, in human health, in ecosystem health. So having said that, we are now starting a new global movement to protect the global microbiome, our internal microbiome, to stop the genetic engineering enhancement of potentially pandemic pathogens, to secure facilities that use or create microbes, to assign strict liability for release. And we want it not just in the United States, but everywhere on the planet, because that's the scale of this. Yeah. So- that is what I'm doing with my summer vacation. That is what <laughs> I'm focused on. And that's why after 25 years of a very successful campaign building, movement building yeah. on, on consumer choice, now we have to implement strict regulations, laws, policies, and do massive education. Because laws themselves are not stable. Governments are not stable. I was flown to Poland by the government gave a press conference with the Minister of Environment praising their non-GMO position. Uh -huh. A week later, a new government was elected that was pro-GMO. Oh, I lobbied ministers and ministries in Thailand. They said, okay, no GMOs in field trials. I made an impact on that. But a, 10 days later, it was a new government and they allowed GMOs in field trials. So if we just try and solve it on the level of government, we are risking all living beings and all future yeah. generations on something which we cannot rely on. We, but, need to, we need everyone in the world to know that we've come to this time where we need to be stewards of all living beings and all future generations. And most urgently and importantly, using the pandemic as a wake-up call, most urgently, the microbes and viruses, which are so fundamental to life on this planet.
it's really the bottom up model. Yeah. You know, community level, microbiome level, we're working that direction. I've not found that you know, the top down governmental regulations work all that well. Well, in this case, we have to do both. Yeah, agreed. You know, we need, we want cities and counties to ban it. We want states to ban it, but we want governments, but also international treaties. We want World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, UN. We basically, here's the thing. Everyone, almost not everyone, but a lot of people in the world know about climate change. Yep. Whether they believe it or not, they know about it. Yes. Okay. There's only a handful of people that appreciate this existential threat. Now, it is easier to understand. It is easier to understand than climate change. And it is, and all it involves is an understanding of mathematics. You release one GMO that's a potential biological time bomb because it can change its character or its impact depending on conditions that it may acquire later in its life mm -hmm. or in areas that you did not anticipate. So that's, a, that's one. Now multiply it by 10,000 or 100,000 or a million GMOs introduced. And you realize, oh my God, we have now destabilized ecosystems that have been you know, built Stable over millions things. of years, yeah. right? So it's just, it's, it's simple to understand. And so we, that's our advantage. And so we need to, everyone to know that. And the, the, so you've spoken to the surprise side effects and exponential side effects. And uh, I just want to touch a little bit on that because this can, just like COVID did inside of 90 days or 120 days spread through most of the world, the same thing could happen here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The thing is, what's interesting about the side effects of genetic engineering, let's just call it three classes. The first is the process of genetic engineering creates unpredictable changes in the organism. Yes. Hundreds of thousands of mutations in the genome, changes in the RNA, changes in the protein, changes in the metabolites, changes in its structure and function. Second, even if it were perfect, which it's not. And remember, the most common result of genetic engineering is surprise side effects. But even if it was as they describe, simply removing one gene, putting a page into in, a new page in the book, which is totally simplistic and wrong, that we don't understand because genes function as networks, as families, as yeah. systems. Mm -hmm. So you increase one, it's like um, there was, they fed RNAi, a, 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 gen, a genetic um, regulation element, to honeybee larva, thinking it would have no impact. A single meal, it was supposed to have zero impact. It changed the function of over 1,400 genes, 10% of the genome of the honeybee. Wow. So they had no idea. They, they expected it to do nothing. And it, it, it was basically a capture of the genome. So even if it's exactly what you want, it may produce things you didn't intend in the organism. Mm -hmm. And the third level is in the environment. So maybe in your hundreds or thousands of mutations, you have silenced a gene that you thought was unneeded and worthless. But it turns out in the case of hot weather, a particular disease, the uh, presence of a particular ally or predator, then it's supposed to kick on. But let's say it doesn't kick on, or let's say it kicks on double or triple. Somehow you've created changes that you have no idea how to predict because you can't take that organism into all of its potential future ecosystems and relationships and conditions and temperatures and diseases. And so we have the unpredicted side effects from the process. We have the unpredicted side effects from moving and changing DNA. And we mm -hmm. have the unpredicted side effects in the ecosystem. And now hand the ability to change the DNA to anyone with $169 to get a do-it-yourself kit in Amazon. And that may be a very limited in terms of, okay, you can do these five things with this strain. But for 2000 bucks, you now have a flexible lab where you can order the, the genetic constructs for the price of dinner to create a new organism that's never been part of, of nature. And you could release it. And it may die, but it may not. Yeah. Wow. That's a powerful statement. And so we've, we've talked for almost 30 minutes now about the problem. What can we do about it? Uh, and let's talk about what we can do about it and protect nature now. What do you have okay. to do with there? 
Let's start with protectnaturenow.com. Okay. .com. Protectnaturenow.com. Everyone who's like, eyebrows are up, eyes are wide, you know, like those Memorex commercials, the wind is like the blowing the yep. air. Like, oh exactly. Yep. Everyone, everyone who's in that position now, or even mildly interested in, you know, if you breathe, eat, or exist in nature, then you qualify. Um, I would say go to Protect Nature Now and immediately get, share your email with us so we can let you know about a zillion things that we would love to have the world do, but we can't reach the world, we just reached you. Yeah. So be a stand-in for the your, thousand of your closest personal friends, and we may have you click a a message that you can customize or keep as is to go to all of your elected officials, to go to media, to go to Facebook and Twitter and whatnot. We may have a petition that we're going to be needing signed to go to the World Health Organization or Congress or the president. Mm -hmm. We may have a video that we need to share to get viral so it's seen. We may have, if you're a college student, we may have a program that we could implement in the institutional review boards in your university so that they don't approve releases of GMO microbes. There, you know, people will have different ways that they can help. Certainly getting informed knowledge has organizing power. That's number one. Two, we need to run on fuel. Our fuel is financial. We don't have the money to implement the global campaign that we're envisioning. Mm -hmm. We need help. So we ask people to make a contribution on an ongoing monthly basis so we know what's coming and we can hire the staff and create the educational assets that we need <clears throat> based on reliability. So <clears throat> making, a, <clears throat> making a donation to our nonprofit is <clears throat> very, very encouraged and kind of essential right now. Absolutely. We, Jump in we and do a, that. Thank you. We have a – thank you very much, Greg. Yeah. We have a global plan. We have all sorts of positions in our ideal uh, organizational chart. <clears throat> we have products. We have full-length uh, documentary we want to produce, TV show we want to produce. We have all we've envisioned. We've done the visioning of what we need. Now we're in the manifesting stage. And so because we can't afford all of those positions, we're now hiring interns that are doing it for free. Uh -huh. And that's good, but it's not the kind of work that we need to do in the world, this topic deserves the resources it needs to protect all living beings and all future generations. That's worth the investment. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm asking people to support and recruiting experts in all sorts of areas to make sure that we have the highest quality materials with the highest quality impact. Wow. Cool. So I challenge everybody that's listening to go to protectnaturenow.com and make a monthly donation. When we're done recording today, I will log on and I will do that myself. Because Thank you so much. Absolutely. This is, this is the most important conversation we can be having about food and about gut biomes and about our health right here. This is it. Thank you, Greg. I think, you know, there's a certain point in a conversation where I get that people get it. Yeah. It's like, I, if there was something more dangerous and more serious and more immediate and more needing, I would be doing that. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like, it's like when I first got into GMOs, it's like, okay, hardly anyone knows about it. And it's going to alter the, the genome for all future generations. It may affect everyone who eats. And, you know, that was the wake up call that got me started. And we've had success at the Institute for Responsible Technology in building a global movement. We, I trained 1,500 people to speak on it. We organized over 10,000 activists in North America. I helped um, world leaders around the world craft better uh, policies. I testified in many different uh, government um, rooms with ministers and whatnot. I saw how to do it, but it took 25 years. In this case, we don't have the luxury. Right. We don't have 25 years. Right. And and also, I was, my, my job was easier for the last 25 years because I didn't need to change government policy. I just needed a critical number of consumers to change their eating policy. And yep. then even pro-GMO governments like the United States could not stop the power of consumers. Now I need to change 
the government of the United States. I need to make, because the thing is, consumer choice in the supermarket's not going to stop the genetic engineering of microbes right. or insects or trees or grass. We need to have practical, responsible, up-to-date regulations, laws in the government, and we need to have that supported by deep understanding and commitment from the population. So it's a multi-year project. I'm aware of that. But it's also absolutely urgent now. Yeah. Amen. And the short film, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, tell me about that. Well, you know, I started it before the pandemic. Uh -huh. And we, I had interviewed Elaine Ingham She's twice. amazing. Yeah. She's I had amazing. interviewed her in like 2012 and 2014. So I had the short hair version of Elaine, the long hair version of Elaine. <laughs> and I, I got into the deep story of it. And, you know, since my focus was on health, I never really did, I didn't do anything with it. I put her, I put some of her comments into one of my films, I think Genetic Roulette. But I didn't go deeply into the story of this near cataclysm. I was just waiting and it was, it was priority two. Right. It was, I never get to priority two. Trust me, it never happens that I can get to priority two because there's always a priority one that's either urgent or supremely important. And now I got to the microbiome and I got to, you know, protecting, protect nature now. And I went, oh, that's the story. Let's lead with that. Yeah. So we pulled out, we pulled up the footage, created some materials. I also it was no, I had known about this uh, ice minus the changes of the, of the, of the uh, frost uh, bacteria. Mm -hmm. I knew about that. That was perfect. Then all of a sudden we have the pandemic. And the pandemic turns out to be the perfect, and I, I use the word perfect in a, in a cautious way. Yes. Wake up, wake up call. I mean, yes, it has had devastating impacts. And that's why the wake up call is so resounding. Because if the pandemic successfully alerts people to the ability for microbes and viruses to spread and wreak havoc and causes us to lock it down, its outcome, its silver lining, at least one of them, may be to have protected all living beings and all future generations from the folly of humans going forward. So that's what I'm hoping. And that's why I realized, oh, we need to do something different. We can't lead with bacteria. We need to lead with the pandemic because there are lessons here. There are lessons that everyone has an unmet need to protect future generations from. So now we have a pandemic angle, which is completely appropriate because the pandemic is with a virus, which is part of the microbiome, and it has the lessons. And so what do we need to do? Now we need to gather people to implement the, the, the solutions. So the arc of this short film, and mm -hmm. it is short, is using the pandemic to alert us, introducing these, oh my God, incidences of you know near catastrophes, Awakening people to the role of the microbiome for the first time that it is this amazing foundational um, field that's critical to our health and then say, we need to protect it. Here's where you go and we'll tell you what to do. We don't go into the details of all the ways to protect it in the film. We want to keep the film short. We want it to go viral on social. And so the longer the, longer the number of minutes, the less likely it's going to be seen especially by the younger generation. So we have a trailer that's two minutes and 20 seconds. And that has, by the time this thing airs, it'll probably have half a million views. It's got about 300,000 now. Yeah. So, so um, we were using that as the alarm. You know, pandemic is the first general alarm. We're using this as a specific alarm and then inviting people to come into our world and get the education. Because once you, once you say, okay, I'm interested, here's my, here's my email impress me. <laughs> right. You, we will impress you. Yeah. We will impress you and, and educate you. There'll be, most people are going to just say, yeah, I'll just want to hear about it. Then there's going to be some that'll say, I want to do something about it. We'll go, okay, good. Cause I'm an activist too. Yeah. And this, this is, this is what I get excited about. So you want to do this, you want to do this, who do you are, who do you are, who are you? What are your skills? What do you want to do? Let's get working. And so we have a whole activist training and, and participation program. Oh, nice. That we're building up too. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So you're continuing on the training piece. Oh, yeah. The thing is this. What happened was when I started training people to speak on GMOs, 
and I started going into deep knowledge. You see, most of the, most everyone who talked about the dangers of GMOs to health when they was kept it very very light, right. and they followed they followed the role of like current event news where it has like one sentence where it says, you know, bear Monsanto says it's safe. Others say it could cause problems and that's it. Right. So I realized I need to write an article, seven pages just on this one particular study. And not everyone would read seven pages, but those that did, they often started their own group. So I, I found one woman that had a group of, of moms of autistic kids. And she was basically quoting for me. I had one person who ran a health food store and he had basically a group of people he was teaching. I, w I realized that the information that we had given out yes. with knowledge as organizing power was already creating small groups. And we had to catch up and create the tipping point network and be more formal about it. But we were reacting to what was starting to happen in little pockets of people who had deep knowledge. So then we brought out, you know, we brought out um, PowerPoint that was scripted, which was a speaker training program, an activist training program how to organize for lectures, how to give lectures, how to organize for media, et cetera, et cetera. And now it's expanded to social media. So yeah, I'm used to doing that. And even, even like I used to travel around giving a talk, you know, alerting people and they would change their diet, but they didn't know how to organize and I wasn't helping them. Then I realized it, I was hoping that there would be a group that invited me to take the names of everyone and to bring it. But sometimes they didn't, sometimes they didn't. Mm -hmm. So I created what's called an activist circle protocol where I said, who wants to help on this? Meet me, meet with me, we'll form in a circle. Within 30 minutes with a specific protocol, we'd know who was meeting, we'd have all their contact information, what they particularly wanted to do before the next meeting, what their skills were, and some ideas for the resources and wow. strategies for that area. And it was very specific and it was like super fast. And like people said it was the most effective and efficient activist meeting they'd ever been to whoa because i was leaving the next morning <laughs> and i needed to make sure i was leaving behind a, a a viable group with specific leaders in a place to meet they knew where they were going to meet how often they were going to meet all within that 30 minutes and we taught people how to run those run those meetings so that's sort of part of my dna now is building movements <clears throat> and thank you so yeah you're welcome <laughs> so thank that's you. why it's easy for me to say, okay, we need we need millions of people involved. We need you know all the major governments. We need inter intergovernmental organizations. Got it. I'm on it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so go to protectnaturenow.com. Please make a donation. Make it a monthly donation if you can, and uh, watch a short film that's mm -hmm. there. That's uh, I watched it earlier today. I got the two minute version, and it's powerful. So thank you for that. You're welcome. You have a podcast. And I, do. I was so excited. It's been about a year and a half, maybe, right? You know, I, I, I don't know, but it's called Live Healthy, Be Well. You can go to livehealthybewell.com. Yes. And <clears throat> you see, because I'm dealing with so many areas, Greg, you know, I have Facebook Lives. Oh, I yeah. have, I'm on summits. I do, like, later today, I'm doing a, a, a recording for release in, in response to uh, something that Bear is announcing, Bear Monsanto. Um I realized that I can repurpose things. So if I oh, do yes. a press, if I do a, a Facebook live, it can go on the podcast. I do as part of our newsletter, which is every other week um, for new Institute for responsible technology. I do what's called Jeffrey's take where I'll share what's happening in the news in the context of genetic engineering that we know about for 25 years. All right. So, so that I'll put that up on the podcast. So I'll throw things on there. You know, I'll, I'll do an interview. If I could steal this one, I'd throw it on my podcast too. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm in. I was going to ask that, but I was like, well, maybe not. But oh, you no, got are you it. kidding? All are right. Are you kidding? Absolutely. So for those for the those on my podcast now that are listening to this, tell them what the name of your podcast is. The Urban Farm Podcast. You can find out it find it at urbanfarmpodcast.com. All right. So now we're cross pollinating. See, one thing that's very interesting is in terms of global movement building. It's non-territorial, right? You know, you oh, know yeah. people, we have to. We have to. It's not about look at me. It's about let's do this. Yeah, <laughs> it's like how can we make everybody's boat float higher? How can Precisely. we collaborate? How can we work together? Because this, my goal since 1991, uh, has been to be the person on the planet responsible for transforming our global food system, and that gets me up every morning. 
and I know that I can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, this is a global project. So all I do every day is I throw out great information that empowers people like this podcast today. So it's collaboration, baby. And I want to say, I honor you for stating so boldly, without apology, without condition, what your mission is. Mm. I, I think that is not only refreshing, it's instructive. You know, you could have said, well, you know, one, one thing that I want to help out at is I want to make a contribution towards and sort of, you no, know, you said, I'm here to do this. Yeah. And I need help and I'm not going to do it alone. But you did that. I'm, and I need help and I'm not going to do it alone. You did that second, which tells me you're owning your own mission and the vision that mm. you have. And absolutely. Like, like my, my slogan is think huge. Thinking big is so last century. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Thinking big is so last century. We don't we don't have big problems. We have huge problems. So nature can respond. People can respond to huge problems. If I said to you, OK, we want to protect uh, GMO introduction here in Northern California. Would you like to make a donation? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm working on something else. If I say we're going to protect the global microbiome to protect all living beings and all future generations. And that's just phase one. Right. You know, and it's like, oh. Now I'm interested. Yeah. So we already have an example from this podcast of people listening and being moved because of the vision of the problem and the vision of the person willing to make the solution, right? Yeah. This is, this is magnet, a magnet. This is magnet, magnetic. If you have an impulse, I'm talking to the people now listening to, because you have this already. So this is for the people listening. If you have an impulse to do something huge, if you think that, oh, am I good enough? Am I, am I going to get, am I going to be successful? What will people yep. think of me? Now you're, but you're hitting against your own glass ceiling. Yep. Right. But there's a part of you, a version of you that lies above the ceiling, above the roof. Yes. And you can actually get there instantly by saying yes to that part, mm -hmm. because that, and that part is fearless. That part knows this is why I'm here. And that part all of a sudden gets as if the resources to start accomplishing it. Mm -hmm. Cause it's not, it's not involved each day in the fear. Can I, can't I, can I, can't I? Cause that just recruits energy at that small level. Right. When you go above the roof, above the forest and you say, okay, I'm here to, transform the global food supply. I'm here to protect the genetic integrity of all living beings and all future generations. Mm. You know, yeah. it's like, okay, that's what I'm here for. Bring it on. And as I, as I used to say, after writing um, the first, my first book, Seeds of Deception, I paraphrased uh, Ernest Hemingway. I mean, I destroyed his quote, but I paraphrased it for my purposes. <laughs> and I said, uh, sometimes I write to the best of my ability and other times I write better. <laughs> it's nice. like, it's like when you're when you're lined up yes. for for this, then you get the resources. It's like if we're here to support all living beings and all future generations, if their destiny is tied up with our actions, perhaps we can get support from nature herself. And that appears to be happening in my life and those of us who yeah, who stepped up to protect her. So Absolutely. It, so this is the spiritual. And the and if you think about when you the new psycho the new science of consciousness and nature and how yep. we're all connected, it's actually uber scientific way of understanding how being in this thinking huge is a advanced technique for our personal development and for global change. Yeah. Well, and I've found over and over and over again. In fact, my team has a name for it. They call it the bacon gods. And the bacon gods are the gods that show up and save your bacon. <laughs> and Janice, my, my manager, she's my manager now, she manages me, uh, noticed it about four years ago that when I talk, when I make a statement, when I say this is going to happen, and it happens, invariably it happens, that's what she calls the bacon gods. So our words have power. Yes. Our, our words have amazing power. And I, I, I want to go back to something you said just a minute ago 
about this, and I call it the monkey mind. Mm -hmm. Something happened for me in 2004 when I started paying attention to that voice in my head that said, Greg, who are you to do this? And I remember having a conversation, and those of you that are watching this on video, you can see what I did. I turned to the right, up to the right and looked, and I started talking to that voice. And I said, shut the H up. What I'm doing in the world, this was 2004, I said, what I'm doing in the world is much more important than whatever the hell you have to say. And it silenced it. It silenced it. And I had to do a little bit more work. But what I get now is the other side of that coin. So I'm, I'm what they call a legacy runner for the uh, Phoenix Rock and Roll ma Half Marathon, which means I've done it every time since it started in 2004. And I have Lyme disease, and all my listeners know that. And a couple of years ago, I ran into a wall with the Lyme disease, metaphorically, and I just wasn't up for running a half marathon, doing a half marathon. And I verbalized that I didn't think I was going to be doing the half marathon this year, that particular year. And this voice, this roaring voice came at me. And it said, not, who do you think you are? It said, listen, you made a commitment, get out there and do it. So there is a way to turn that monkey mind into a powerful powerful voice for you. I've done it. You can do it. So thank you for bringing that up. And, and as, as we're on the same theme, and it's so great to, to connect with you this way, I remember meeting you first in 2013 and was deeply impressed with your vision mm -hmm. and commitment to get mm -hmm. a big, big things done. Yeah. As I told you when we started, before we started recording, I remember what you said eight years ago at a dinner table in Phoenix. You, it, it did not leave me because you were there saying, I'm going to do this. Yeah. And, and you were holding yourself up as a model. I went, oh, I'm going to follow this guy. I want to know this guy. Let's see what this guy does. So the once we have that yes, once we say that yes, then if we get out there and are a spokesperson, yes, we get out there and we are a representative of that goal and that issue, then what happens is there's a kind of a polishing of the rough edges of our personality. Oh, yes. Because we're not, we're not operating on the personal level when we do that. We're operating on the collective level. We're operating in a huge way. And people will come up to me and say, you know, I'm your biggest fan. You're my idol. You're my hero. Um, you know, you changed my life. You saved my life. You saved my family's life. And I'm like, in that role, I'm not little Jeffrey. In that role, I am holding a space for this leader that I have offered myself to be, this servant as mm -hmm. I've offered myself to be. And it's not an ego thing when they say that. It doesn't, no. it doesn't touch my ego at all. It's like, how can I inspire and serve this person even more? But the whole process, because I traveled a lot. For 13 years, I was traveling six to nine months a year. That's a lot of traveling. Yeah. And speaking and all that. And it was like honing and polishing and permissioning and enforcing what it's like to be a servant in the role of a leader to just do it naturally and easily. And again, grinding down any rough edges of the personality and just offering oneself to that. And this is the real intense advanced, advanced technique, incredible advanced technique for personal growth and for world change. Yeah. Think big. No, think huge. That's right. Think gigantic. <laughs> I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. So I remember I was living in Iowa, and I had just spent a lot of time in California trying to help the passage of Prop 37, which was to require labeling of GMOs. I'd given 51 lectures. I released the film Genetic Roulette in time to, to have any difference. And I tried unsuccessfully to direct the messaging of the campaign to focus on the health dangers because I and others were very confident that simply saying it's our right to know 
was a weak argument that could be turned around by the lies of the biotech industry mm-hmm. who said, yeah, and, you're, and your right to know is going to cost you $555 per person per year if you require GMOs to be labeled, which was a lie. I mean, it was not true at all. It wouldn't right. cost anything. Um, and we lost. But I was sitting in... I remember uh, that. It was in Iowa on election night, and I, I went and checked um, the results, and I went, oh, we lost. And it took me about 30 seconds to rebound. In 30 seconds, it was like, okay, we'll get it some other way. Well, and if I remember correctly, you lost by a, a shaving, didn't you? Yeah. Totally. Yeah, it was like so close. Yeah. So, you know, I realized that I wasn't able to convince the message makers about the health danger as the primary. I was, I was saying, for example, that if you win... Even if you win on your right to know, it could be overturned by the FDA or whatever and preempted for states' rights so it becomes a federal thing. And all the money that we've spent educating people becomes nowhere because we haven't used the millions of dollars that were available for our campaign to actually drive consumer demand away from GMOs because it wouldn't have mattered whether we win or lose if we have figured out the formula to collapse all na- all consumer support for GMOs, it would be it would be gone, and the bigger issue would have happened. And ultimately, what happened was, we lost there. We lost in three other states. But when it was passed in Vermont and about to be implemented, the Congress did preempt states' rights, yep. just as we had thought, and we ended up collapsing all of the states' um, fighting. So I had tried to warn against that. I, I had contacted the leaders of the different states after that, trying to convince them. I was unsuccessful. So it was a failure in California of the, uh, of the vote. It was a failure in the other three states of the vote. It was my failure to convince the leaders that to not listen to their political consultants who said, either you educate or you win. If you try and educate, you're going to lose. So if you try wow. and educate people about the health dangers, you're going to lose the vote. And I tried to say, yeah, but if we win the vote, we still may lose because of the preemption. It didn't go very well. So I just, you know, I just continued to educate. And I knew that we didn't need to get 100% of the voters, eat, of the consumers eating non-GMO. We didn't need 51%. We needed maybe 5% of consumers dedicated to non-GMO eating and we could collapse support by the food companies. So... Uh, even though That's the political the political um, fight gave us the ability to get some of our messaging out. Yeah. And you know, my, my, my film, Genetic Roulette, was released that year, 2012. And the number, the percentage of Americans that believe that GMOs could cause harm increased by 10%. Wow. By 10% in that one year. And I know that my film had been played on over, played over 300 times on PBS stations. It was seen by 2 million people, you know, a million and point two within the week wow. that it was released. So I think I had something to do with that. And uh, uh, even though the ballot initiatives were simply saying, it's your right to know, we don't know what it'll do, but we need to know. It was like, ah, uh, so the, it was, it was a, yeah. the, the impact that you had has been long lasting. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I mean, we've been, we were successful. Ultimately we were successful. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you consider your biggest success? That I say, you know, I was aiming for 5% of the U.S. population being dedicated non-GMO eaters. Now we have 51% of Americans that believe that GMO foods can cause long-term health problems. Wow, that's and huge. way more than 5% who are dedicated non-GMO eaters. So we have more numbers than we need, and that is now driving the changes that we saw happening and that we knew were going to happen. When you have that kind of consumer demand, it means that you know, if Nabisco has a cookie on the shelf and there's a neighbor, a neighbor on the shelf that has non-GMO and they start increasing market share, Nabisco, why would they want to keep GMOs? GMOs in. Yeah. Because there's no consumer benefit. It's just added, it's just a pesticide, you know, sponge. It either you add more Roundup to it or you produce a pesticide to kill an insect. There's no consumer benefit to GMOs. There's no greater, you know, whatever. So we knew that if we had the numbers, we would win. And so we're winning. And so that I'd say was my greatest accomplishment. If you want to, it's not mine. I mean, it's our, our yeah. greatest accomplishment was to build and, and implement a movement based on messaging, which I did pioneer and others came in and, you know, it's, it's a group. We collaborated, now, right. We yeah, do absolutely. this, we do this together. 
totally. We, you know, I believe that really the downfall of our culture is, is competition. Collaboration is where we make our best work at and make our best advance, advancements. So collaborate. How can we work together? Absolutely. Yeah. And what drives you? What's your big why in the world? Well, saving all living beings and all future generations is probably a nice choice. Um, Woohoo! Love it. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm here to do a job, and it's more important than other things. And I'm able to get my life, I'm able to have a, a good life at the same time. Yeah. You know, there's a all these environmental activists talk about sustainability. And I say, yeah, but is your career sustainable? Right. If is every time... Health? Yeah. If I mention, if every time I mention the word Monsanto, I have a physiological uh, uh, constriction. If I get depressed or angry or sad every time I talk about the dangers that I'm talking about, that is not sustainable. That is devastating. Yeah. But one of the ways that I'm sustainable is to be optimistic, to model that optimism and help people get over that fear yeah. and get active. So, yeah. So I have to be a sustainable activist. That's why I can do it for 25 years and now launching a new movement. Um, and that's, that is driven by an understanding of that I'm here to help on global issues and within the GMO frame. Yeah. What, so when I was in the eighth grade, it was 1974, I wrote a paper on how we were overfishing the oceans. I've known since I was a teen, preteen, that there's something wrong with the way we're growing food on the planet. And what I've found for myself in this arena, when I ask myself what drives me, it's, it's whatever messaging that, you know, who knows from past life or I don't know where it comes from. It's just what I have to do. And sometimes it's a gift. Most of the time it's a gift. Sometimes it's a curse. Do you find that same thing? I don't find it a curse. No? No. So going back to what you said a moment ago was presenting this positive forward moving thing. That's how you get past that piece. It sounds like maybe. Um, I mean, it's built in. It's not like, Oh, I think I'll be positive because it's important. I am a positive, optimistic person. So am I. And it's also important. Um, the, the, what is harder to navigate Greg is the fact that I have never had the resources to accomplish things at the pace that I wanted to. Mm, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I've never had, I've been organized, we've never had a million dollars a year to work with in our, our, our nonprofit. Right. And we need a lot more than a million right now yeah. for this global campaign. Um, and so there was always a to-do list that was beyond my capacity to do. And there was, always, like I said, I never get to, two, to number two priorities. And I had to make peace with that mm, and just yeah. go, okay, let's just find where I can best spend my time and best try and raise resources to accomplish more. And that's where, if you say there's a curse, it's only if I, if I allow it to be. It's only in my head. Got right. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, cause the reason I say that is cause some days it just, the magnitude of what we're up against is daunting. And when I let that get in my, in my view, that's, I think that's when it becomes a curse. All right, Greg, I'm going to give you a little analogy that I like to play with. Cause you said past lives and whether or not people believe in past lives, Agreed. here is a, here is a story as if. Okay. 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 So when you and I got our envelope for our assignment, <laughs> right? We went back to the reception and said, there must be a problem. <laughs> All right. This, this is only one small planet. And they say, oh, no, it's an important planet. Oh, okay, okay, we'll go and help. So the matter of size is perspective. You can, it's mm -hmm. relative. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, this is just one small planet. We can handle this. You know, this is just, this is just the food supply. Or you can think, oh, God, this is the whole food supply. It's just, just a matter the, of perspective. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I'll take it. Thank you. And a book you might recommend for our listeners. This is interesting. I read a lot, but not books. I read, you know, I get a hundred important emails a day, mm, get mm -hmm. on all sorts of listservs. I always recommend my books, but they're old. They're not current event books. In terms of another person's book, if you are really into the history and details 
of the arguments and the progress and all that of the GMO movement, uh, Steve Drucker wrote a beautiful book, Alter Genes, Twisted Truth. It's over 400 pages. Yep. It's dense. It's dense. I mean, like, I like easier sentence structures. He's a lawyer and yeah. he wins the argument. My God, he wins the argument. You finish reading that or even a chapter and you go, oh my God, that was brilliant. So his is, his is amazing. And um, I'm also looking forward to Carrie Gillum's book that's upcoming about the, the Monsanto papers. The, the oh, trial. yes. You've talked about that on your podcast, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's come out with a bo new book based on the trials and the Monsanto papers because I was involved in the trials. Excellent. Thank you. And a final piece of advice for our listeners. You know, I, let me think about what rises spontaneously. Oftentimes I get to the end of my talk and I'll say, and I want to close by saying this. And I actually have no idea what I'm going to say. Uh -huh. So I want to close by saying this. We have explored an enormous topic. We've explored an idea that can affect the existence of humanity, the existence of ecosystems. And we've also talked about a potential role that we can play, which is probably bigger than you are thinking for yourself. My experience uh, helping to motivate people to get active is that right now is the most critical time. This moment for making a commitment to something. Now, maybe you are, maybe it's to get involved with our campaign, Protect Nature Now. Maybe it's to pursue that thing that you've, has been gnawing inside you and you got inspired by something that Greg said or I said. Now is the pregnant moment. And if you wait five minutes or one day or one month, it becomes like a rumor in the past, a vague memory. The, the invitation is opened up right now to make a commitment. How that commitment is made, whether you say it out loud, write it down, get online, make a phone call, start your book, whatever it is, this is the time to use this energy. Because if you start here with all the momentum of what we've talked about, the chances of your success are far greater than if you put it off until after you eat or when you get home. Pull the car over. <laughs> Decide now. That's my, my last point. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Jeffrey. So how can our listeners find you? Okay. Now you have to write a bunch of things down. So now All that right. you've pulled over, whatever. <clears throat> so protectnaturenow.com. The mothership of our organization is responsibletechnology.org. We have lots of resources there. You can click over to petsandgmos.com, to rounduprisks.com. I also have another completely different list organization at livehealthybewell.com. There we have, I've created a 90 day lifestyle upgrade to help people switch to organic by using the tips and tricks of people that have been doing it for years, along with introducing you to some people that have amazing products that can help in your new lifestyle. I have a, a program called Healing from GMOs and Roundup, what you can do in addition to avoiding GMOs, what you can do to rebuild the body. We have the film Secret Ingredients, which is convinces people to eat organic better than anything else. We know that from pre and post tests because it shows the impact on people's health when they switch to organic, which is dramatic. The film delivers. So if you're the kind of person that has been eating healthy because you've been listening to Greg's podcast or my podcast, but you want to convince your kid or your parents or your, or your spouse, then secret ingredients will deliver the goods like nothing else, I believe. And that's what people tell me. And that's available at livehealthybewell.com. And you can also get the podcast. So those that's a good start. We have Facebook. We have other things. But that, that, that's you'll find it all there. Awesome. And on Live Healthy Be Well, I noticed you had a, uh, a pet veteran, a veterinarian come on and talk about non-GMOs for your pets, which is also really important. Um, oh, my God. It's like I, I uh, we have a whole petsandgmos.com website. Yeah. We have a short video there with lots of veterinarians and pet owners. The impact on cats and dogs who eat GMOs or get off of GMOs is like day and night. Yeah. When GMOs were introduced, there was a skyrocketing of all these diseases that were not even taught in veterinary school or very downplayed. And when the vets realize that it's the food, 
and they put them on organic. <laughs> it's like, according to this one veterinarian who is Oprah's veterinarian, 80 to 90 percent of the situation is resolved. Mm-hmm. 80 to 90 percent of her of her patients. Yeah. The food. Yeah. Well, amen to that. We all have pets that we love. Yep. Thank you once again. And you can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash protect nature now. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.